All righty, Five Fitters, we're live. Paul Fifield on the podcast today. Uh, Paul has obviously had a decorated career in martial arts as well as a coaching career um, and also is the head of Fight Fit in, uh, in Collingwood mainly or both? No, only South uh, Melbourne. Yeah. I never go to Collingwood. Yeah. There's weird people there. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so also Paul runs the Fight Fit Challenge, is the head trainer, has had a massive impact in my life. So on behalf of a lot of people, I'd like to say thank you for the good work that you do uh, at Fight Fit in helping change people's lives as well. So thank it's you, mate. Pleasure, mate. It's, it's very enjoyable. Yeah. Um. So, what? Where did it all start for you? Um. You mean as far as my combat in combat fighting and yeah, that? yeah, yeah. Well, what what sort of got you into like training martial arts? My my brother did karate with Bob Jones Corporation. Mm. Bob Jones was a big redheaded bloke. He started up a, a 1969 or thereabouts, and my brother was one of his first generation black belts. Mm. And in 1974, I got permission from my parents at finally, at long last, and I joined my brother in, in training in karate. Is it an older brother? My, oh, yeah, definitely my older brother. Yeah. <laughs> seven yeah. years old. I was his seventh birthday present, actually, born on the yeah, same oh, day. Oh, really? Yeah. That's unreal. So I was born on Steve's seventh birthday, and I wanted to follow in his, his mm. steps. And then you had your first fight in the how many fights in the amateurs did you have? Uh, in those days, there was mm. really no distinction between amateurs and pros. Mm. For example, my first fight, I was 16 years old. Yeah. And we used to train on Friday night in the Bob Jones Corporations. Every Friday night, we trained at his uh, dojos. And um, our instructor, Dave, Dave Berry, uh, he was a very hard man. And basically, it was just, it was just full on just punching each other in the head and yeah. kicking each other in the head, just karate without you know, with contact. There's no, there's no training today, you're fighting. Mm. I said, well, what do you mean? He says, no, we've got fights here tonight with some people from other clubs are coming over. And there was no ring. There was definitely no doctors, yeah. none at all. So, so my first fight was standing on a couple of bits of tape, five feet apart or so, looking at some other bloke. I was 16, he was 30 years old. And... Um, we punched and kicked each other. At the end of the round, we stood facing each other again. So did, did you have like glove wear? We had, we had gloves on and yeah. foot pads on, you know, yeah. pads you on it, was, our feet. it was a karate fight. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah. We, they called it, uh, they called it kickboxing or full yeah. contact karate in those days. Oh, yeah. okay. Awesome. My, my, my second fight was an interesting fight. It was at the Melbourne town hall mm. and uh, we still didn't have a ring and the, the stage is a slight angle like that, you see. Mm. So it was pretty um, interesting strategy because if I fought on the higher ground, it was easier for me to kick him in the head. Yeah. So so that's where I fought. <laughs> I had to win that fight as well. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So it's pretty. Fun. It's obviously pretty different uh, back in those days as to how it is now. How would you sort of compare the kickboxing world in those days to now? Oh, it's totally different. Jake, I don't even know where to start. You know, I'll give you some examples. We had uh, we had no registered referees. We mm. had no registered trainers. We had no doctors at the at the fights. It yeah. was just it was just um, whatever. Do whatever you feel like. like mm. Percy Lanciano and myself, we used to run fight nights once a month at Bob Jones Corporation. He had a ring, so that was something different. Mm. And <laughs> Yeah, we the luxury. Uh, yeah, it was it was great. It just cost you two dollars to get in. Yeah, two bucks to get in, and if you fought, we gave you your money back. <laughs> and and some nights we had we had some uh, great fights there. You know, yeah, and and lots of fights. You know, I tell a story often um, about Martin De Bono, who was the head bouncer at um, one of the nightclubs in town. Um, you probably know it, but I've forgotten the name of it. Um, I, I might have been there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, he came out. He came back out at the end of the first round. I was refereeing that fight, and his eye was totally closed over. Mm. And I said, oh, "I've got to stop the fight, mate. You can't see." He goes, "What are you talking about? I can see out of the other eye." You know, he's pretty tough bloke. I said, yeah. "No, mate, no, I've got to stop the fight." He goes, "Someone here's got to have a knife. You could cut it." You know, I said, "You've been watching Rocky too much, mate." So <laughs> I, I stopped the fight on him. But that's the sort of days that we had there. You know, like. I remember one of my fights, I actually fought on one of these mm. nights. There was a very tough professional fighter named Zenon Gramonski. Mm. I think that's how you pronounce his last night. He, he'd had three huge fights, 10-rounders with Percy Lanciana. Mm. And 
Percy won every every one of those fights. And at the end of the fight, as soon as the referee put up Percy's hand, he'd lean over to Percy and he'd go, rematch, anytime. <laughs> you know, on the last time they fought, Percy, give it to him. Like Zeta yeah. was tough. He was tough. I reckon Percy won every round 10 8, sometimes 10 7. I don't know how the fight was. And he just stopped. kept going. And as soon as the fight was over, he leaned over and goes, rematch. Anytime. <laughs> anyway, he rocked up to one of these two dollar a night fights. You know, he rocked up, and he goes, um, oh, "I want to fight." And he put a bit of weight on. You know, he was he was now seventy kilos. He used to fight. He used to fight Percy at sixty. You mm. know. And I said, "Oh, I'm seventy kilos. I can fight him." And Percy goes, "No, you can't, mate. You, you've just finished squ- squats. You know, I've been squatting for an hour. You know, I was doing a few weights." He goes, "Oh, Fair if enough. we fight at the end of the night, mate." Maybe I'll be recovered by then, you know. Yeah. And uh, Zen and I had a, had a had a fight, which I won, of course. <laughs> and uh, he didn't lean over to me and say rematch any time. Yeah. yeah. I think he just it was funny. And when, I, when did you sort of start getting into pro fights type thing? As I said before, there was not much. There's yeah. not much of a difference, you know. Mm. I'll, I'll tell you, as as you know, one of these fights that we had. I'm going to go back to the end yeah, because yeah, there's some funny stories. Go, there, mate. You know? Go, go for it. Dave Hedgecock is you know a pretty well known name in the boxing yeah. industry. Um, he he'd had a grudge with some with someone out on the street, and they decided that they were going to come to one of these two dollar a night fights mm. and sort it out there. They both paid their two bucks. Yeah. They, <laughs> Bloody oath they did. And we didn't give them their money back, even though they fought. No, no he did. But yeah, so he's a lot um, back in those days. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> and uh anyway, so so Dave and this bloke jump in the ring to fight. Percy Lanciano was refereeing. And halfway through the fight, Dave's given it to this bloke. Mm. You know, Dave Hedros all over him. So this bloke's mates throw the towel in to give it up. <clears throat> Percy reached over and says, No, 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 you don't. Picks the towel up, throws it straight out of the ring. <laughs> Fight continues on. You know, that's you know, no regulations, no boxing yeah. boards. You can do what you Did like. Did they have rounds, or was it just? Yeah, no, we still had rounds. We still had rounds. You know, yeah. These these fight nights were only three rounders, but yeah, you know, Percy just let it go until um, Dave knocked the bike out. You know, that's the sort of night. I remember, I remember one day there was a. Um, if you don't mind me just going on about Mate, these stories, please, by yeah. all means, stories is what we're here for. Yeah, the old night, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> there was there was a group of guys out in Werribee, mm. very very tough gym. Um, run by Sam De Pasquale. Mm. You know, really good, strong blokes with a strong ethic. That they would never give up. Anyway, this is a, <clears throat> ended up unfortunate for one of them this time. But Sammy's younger brother, um, uh, oh, Tony De Pasquale, was the guy mm. who ran it all. His younger brother Sammy was fighting. Anyway, Sammy got caught. He got caught clean, and he was he was very wobbly on his feet. And the referee went. And McCannify, referee McCannify said, no, no, the fight's over. And and Tony goes, no, let it go on. The referee looked at me and goes, okay, mate, he's your brother. <laughs> fight. <laughs> Bang. Knocked out clean. Knocked out clean. But I think the deepest guys were probably happier with that. Yeah. Because they than never wanted to know to be yeah. given up and, and, to, and to dog a fight. And they would probably rather lose unconscious than giving up. You know, it's unbelievable how, yeah. how tough they must have yeah, been. Those it, days. it was incredible. You know, can you imagine doing that these days? No, no, no way. It just wouldn't happen. Yeah, there was a, there was a gym in Beckett Street. We had a fight night in, in there one time at mm. Beckett Street in the city, and um, I actually fought on that night. And I was eleven stone, fought someone who was thirteen stone. And what's that in the old language? In the new language, seventy kilos compared okay. to eighty something <laughs> kilos. Yeah. Anyway, this bloke kept kicking me in the head with spinning wheel kicks, kicked me right in the jaw, and that time and time again. I don't know how I got the decision, but I did in the end. But that was a funny night because I remember George Zach punched some bloke. First punch of the fight, knocked the bloke out, clean out. And everyone just on the ground, scratching their heads on. The bloke's not waking up. You know, he's un- <laughs> he, was un- he was probably unconscious, you know. So in the end, the fight night's got to go on. So someone grabbed him by the feet. We drag him out, out of the ropes <laughs> and lay him on the side so the next fight can go on. Same thing happens the next fight. This other bloke knocks someone out. So someone comes up with the idea, hey, George, do you want to have another fight? Because you can fight this other bloke who just won that one. <laughs> so they're like, oh, okay. You know, it never happens again. But George knocked that bloke That's out unreal. as well. It's got to be like someone's full-time job to be gra- dragging blokes <laughs> out by their feet. Well, in the end, one of them wasn't waking up. So someone came up with a brilliant idea that you got a lot of nerves on the bottom of your feet. So they held his feet and started punching him in the bottom of the feet to try and wake him up. It worked. The bloke woke up. 
<laughs> of pain stimuli. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the doctor Peter Lewis, who's the you know, one of the you know the best known doctors around? Yeah. Um, in in sports, uh, in 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 the fighting. Yeah. Punching someone on the feet to wake up. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the UFC, like I don't remember this because it was before my time, but the UFC when they first started used to be like bare knuckles and people from dis- different disciplines um, all getting in a cage together and fighting that way. Did you ever sort of dip your feet in that world at all in like the cross code? <sighs> I, I remember very, very early on when it first came on when I was in Japan, I was chatting to someone whose hands was all bandaged up. Mm. I said, oh, what happened to you, man? You know? Mm. And he was in one of those fights, and there was very few. I think the only rules then was no um, was no gouging, mm. no groin shots, and maybe no headbutts. Mm. You could do anything else. So he 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 was wrestling with some bloke, and the other bloke just grabbed his fingers and went snap. <laughs> they, they had no rules at all. Yeah. And did I get involved in that? I really only got involved with that a little bit through with Sam Greco when Sam Gre- Greco. It finished yeah. his kickboxing career, yeah. not not in the early days. Yeah. You know? So who who kind of brought um, kickboxing to Australia? Who were the pioneers of the sport? Well, the first big promoter was Bob Jones. Okay, Bob Jones, who we who I started my karate with. He, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was well ahead of his time there, and he he came up with the idea of bringing some people out from America to fight. Um, and one of the first things that I remember. Bob Jones brought out was he brought out Chuck Norris, you know, from Walker, Texas Ranger. Yeah. You know? I think everybody knows Chuck Norris. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's the <laughs> only man that I know who can round out someone in the back of the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he brought him out to do a few uh, demonstrations, you know, running on the, uh, when he was in that movie with, with Bruce Lee. Mm. So he was a bit of a name and um, he actually refereed a fight of mine in Sydney. <laughs> Which is funny. I remember sitting in the sitting in a taxi, driving driving through Sydney with Chuck Norris, and he goes, "Paul, he goes, I'm I'm amazed at how fit you was. His look, because you know? <laughs> in fact, those days we were we were uh, fit looking people. Yeah. Didn't have an obesity epidemic or anything yeah. like that. But I think now we've surpassed America in that. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I'm yeah. not sure what it is. But he was amazed at how fit and healthy we looked. Mm. Yeah, and he refereed uh, a fight of mine there, which is. Uh, Quite an honour. Yeah, absolutely. That would have been unbelievable. What was that like? Did you get a big crowd down to, for everyone to come and see you, obviously? And then I got Chuck punched in the head product. that many times in that fight that I can't really remember how many people were there. Mm. No, it was a decent crowd. It was at <laughs> Melbourne. It was at Melbourne at the um, Sydney Town Hall. Yeah. And um, Chuck Norris was the um, judge, jury, and executioner. He was the referee mm. and the judge, and he put my hand up at the end of that one, which I won. Yeah. As well, you know, so. What's he like as a bloke, Chuck? Very down to earth. Yeah. Very down to earth. Yeah. 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 Very nice. I enjoyed his time with him. Yeah. Awesome. And then, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your world title fight? It's it's a funny question because Mm. I don't have a world title. Mm. I never fought for a world title. Bob Jones brought out um, the American champion, a man by the name of Mark Costello. Yeah. And he brought out the world champion who was also American by the name of Johnny Moncayo. Now, it's it happened that earlier in their careers or a few fights earlier that Mark Costello, the American champion, had beaten the guy who is now the world champion. Hmm. So that's where people think, oh, I've beaten the world champion, but I beat the person who had beaten the world champion. But he was an American, American champion. So we didn't fight for a world title. We didn't fight for a title at all. Hmm. It was just a fight. Bob Jones brought out two people um it was a huge event a huge probably the biggest event that Mel- that australia had ever seen and dave hedgecock was going to fight the world champion johnny moncayo hmm. probably they were around middleweight i think yeah, yeah maybe maybe slightly lighter hmm. slightly lighter and i was a super middleweight 76 kilos thereabouts and i was fighting the u.s champion mark hmm. costello so on Friday night, Dave was fighting in Melbourne. Then we watched that fight. We were, we were to watch that fight. I'll explain that later. Mm. And then we would go to Sydney, and then I was to fight Mark Costello and being, being the main event mm. in, in Sydney at Sydney Town Hall. And um, just before the weigh-in, Dave Hedgecock gets shot. You know, he's got <laughs> nothing to do with the fight game, just yeah. 
Dave Hedgehog gets shot occasionally. He's been <laughs> shot a few times, you know. Actually, the last just time... Just unlucky. He, the, <laughs> just, <laughs> it's in the wrong place at the wrong time, yeah. I think. Actually, the last time he got shot... I can digress. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. The last <laughs> time he got shot, a couple of days later, I saw him walk into the gym. Mm. And he comes up and he over to me and chatted to me a little bit. I said, this is unbelievable. He's been shot in the back. And he's walking around two days later. Like, he's tough. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, what's he doing? And he said, he's just trying to show everybody that he's not human, I think. Yeah. And he's, that he's not scared. Anyway, I watched him walk out of the gym and I followed him to have a look. As soon as he was out of sight, he gets I just shot saw again, him. No. Saw, yeah, he got <laughs> shot again. <laughs> that would have been bad. But I saw him hold his side like yeah. he was in pain, but he just wanted to walk around and show people that. Yeah. That. that that he was all that good. he was okay. Yeah. You can't have even what's a bullet. Yeah. You know? Anyway, unreal. for some reason he got shot. So the fight with Johnny Moncayo mm. was cancelled. Johnny Moncayo did a demonstration fight with one of my very early instructors, Dave Berry, that night. Mm. And the next night in Sydney, I get to fight the US champion. Mm. It was his twenty seventh fight. I think he'd only had two losses, and I hadn't fought in three years. You know, so. Looking on paper, Marcus Costello should have won that. Mm. He should have won that, hands down. But he didn't. He didn't, no. Tell I us about the fight. How did it go down? Um, the referee stopped it in the sixth round. There was regulations now, so yeah. we actually, you know, he wasn't yeah. dragging his feet. The referee stopped it in the sixth round. Yeah. He was copying too much punishment. But I think he, the, only, the reason that I won is because he underestimated his opponent he mm. saw the paperwork and saw he's only had six fights mm. he hasn't fought in three years mm. no point in training and i could feel during that fight that he would go to do something and he just didn't have the timing that day and the fitness that mm. day and i've always been pretty fit and you could probably smell it on him too oh, i could smell it mm. i could smell it near the end I could, yeah. oh, oh i've got this and i was pretty <laughs> excited go, yeah. because because i was not supposed to win yeah you know, I was not supposed to win. Were you and, nervous for that fight? Nah, no, of course I was nervous. <laughs> I would, I would be, I would think about that fight a month in advance, and my heart would go boom, 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 boom. You know, and wow, yeah, it's interesting that you had the exact same thing that I had before. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has the same thing, and and I say it to people now: if you're not nervous, there's something wrong. Hmm. You know. Um, and everyone has their own ways of combating that nervousness. You know, my way was to be act like a clown. Mm. Like I could, when we were getting out of the, out of the hotel to go to the fights, there was limousines to come to pick us up, and it was this was um, you know Bob Jones trying to et, copy the Americans and put a bit of pizzazz in Australian kickboxing, mm. and so he had limousines for us. And I saw Mark Costello and his trainer jump in his limousine, so I jumped in their limousine too and sat next to him. <laughs> Hello, mate. That's probably why you won because you're the mental warfare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was doing mad. the same thing. Like he was in the change rooms next door. I could, you know, we had a, a big partition there. And yeah. I, could, I could hear him. Um, I and mean, I'm just calling out to him, "Hello, Mark. Are you gonna have fun soon, mate. You're gonna have fun." I was, oh. you know, that was one way of me coping with my mm. with my nerves. And everyone has their own ways. Yeah. yeah, everyone has their own ways. It's kind of like the mental warfare. You see that a lot these days. It's like a massive thing with people trying to hype up their fights by talking a lot of trash and stuff yeah yeah That's, maybe maybe you were the uh the trailblazer for that <laughs> no, no no i think um i think uh, muhammad ali was a little bit before my time mate perhaps, and he perhaps, was a man perhaps. he was the man <laughs> yeah everyone has copes with their own with their own nerves that way and I, i'm mm. i'm a big believer that muhammad ali coped with his own nerves that way mm. have you yeah. seen when we were kings yes i have the yeah. documentary yeah. yeah yeah you can you can kind of see it in that in that documentary yeah when he's trying to like hype himself up when he's saying yeah yeah, he's a great fighter. He was yeah. a great fighter and he was fantastic for boxing. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah. What What did you love most about Muhammad Ali? It was different. Mm. I liked his talk. Mm. I liked the way he, he flowed when he fought. He wasn't a regiment people usually were, that most of the champions there were, you know. Mm. You know, he led with his right hand. He did things that were different. He mm. hit people on the way back and scored. Yeah. Kind of like a guy who, well... Kind of like a guy who there was no sort of father to his style in a yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He kind of made his own style. He did. He did make his own style, and that's that's a good way of putting it. He he wasn't stuck to standing there with your feet in the right position and your hands up high. Mm. Like he had his feet down low. You know, mm. it's probably yeah. just like a testament to his character as well. You see that a lot. Um, 
if you if you do your sort of research about Muhammad Ali, that he really is a guy who mar- marches to his own drum, and that translated into his boxing as well. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any other guys you remember who you can like, picture and say that they were a real pioneer of the sport or they were like a real great of the sport for whatever reason? Going to Australia, going to Australia, I've got a, you know, Stan the Man was a big name. Mm. It was a big name. Um, community in Melbourne. Apparently people are saying it's the second largest Greek city in the world next to Athens. <laughs> you, know, you know, I'm from the Oakley area and it's all Greek. You know, yeah. that's, you know English my, is a second language down yeah. that way. My, uh, my, one of my best mates owns Vanilla in Oakley, the oh. restaurant. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So shout out to Dennis Spanos if he's watching. Yeah. yeah. You should come down one time, mate. <laughs> um, I don't speak Greek, so you know, I need a, yeah. <laughs> need a little Berlitz uh, phrase book to go down that way. Yeah. But Stan, Stan the Man was, was definitely a pioneer kickboxing in australia he he was a very interesting in, interesting character stan he he um i believe that stan was a much better fight fighter mm. than he believed and he did the talk and all this sort of stuff to try and build himself up um he had a couple of fights which were questionable as far as the quality of his opponents were concerned mm. but he didn't need to mm. i believe he was better than than what he thought and what some of the people around him thought. He was he was quite intelligent, very heavy leg kicks, mm. good left hook, and he didn't need to have those sorts of fights, you know. Yeah. I'll tell you a story about uh, Stan. Please. Um, this was in Japan. He was fighting Mike Bernardo. Mike yeah. Bernardo's bigger and stronger than Stan and would have knocked him out. Mm. Stan is, uh, is quite a strong Christian. Um, he always... Before, before he fights, he always faces his corner and blesses himself and turns around and walks out to fight. You know, he prays to himself all the time. Mm. Um, and at the end of all his fights, he thanks God for the fact that they're both still healthy at the end of it. So, Fair play. Mike Bernardo is also very religious, mm. a Christian as well. Stan is a thinker. Mm. And Stan's thinking, this bloke's too sh- strong for me, big for me. Mike, Mike Bernardo is six foot four mm. and walks around at 110 kilos or something. You know? So what does Stan do? We're in Japan. We're there a week earlier because we got to acclimatize. And Stan, every morning we come down for breakfast. Who's Stan having breakfast with? You can see he's Mike Bernardo. <laughs> he's becoming his mate. He's becoming his friend. He doesn't want to hurt him after a while. <laughs> and I heard Mike Bernardo's trainer say, Mike, don't get close to him. No, no. When it comes to the fight, no friendships around there. They went out for dinner together even. On the day of the fight, Stan didn't face his corner to cross himself. He turned around. He caught Mike Bernardo's eye. And then he crossed himself. And he walked out there. Mike Bernardo couldn't bring himself to unleash the way he could on Stan. Stan won that before he walked into the ring. It was well done, Stan. Actually, it may, it may have been a draw because not a lot happened. What? Lose that fight. And that was smart. Yeah, that's, he, that's really yeah, smart. Was, you he, do what you got to do. You find a way. Yeah, he was clever. Yeah. He was clever. So not only a good fighter and a strong fighter and technical fighter, but he was also clever as well. He was a strategist, yeah. Mm. Just, I, I fought, I, I fought, no. I trained a guy by the mm. name of Tosca Petridis. Mm. He was at the same time as Stan. Hmm. I mean, Stan hates his story, but he beat Stan as amateurs. Okay. <laughs> Stan said it was a groin kick, but no, I saw that. That was that was in the stomach, and <clears throat> Tosca won that fight. But anyway, Tosca wasn't like Stan. He wasn't he wasn't a strategist. Tosca hmm. had one way, and that was to walk forwards the entire time hmm. when he fought. And he was a great pioneer from Australian kickboxing. I think in the end he had seventy five fights, something yeah. like that. A lot of fights, but his work ethic, I've never ever come across since then and that was his work ethic was unbelievable he i was holding pads for him one day we were training at the underworld gym and we trained at 11 o'clock in the morning Mm. in those days and i'm holding pads for him and he's punching away kicking away and i noticed this blood running down the side of his mouth i said tosca what's with the blood mate Oh, I had my wisdom teeth out. I said, when? He goes, this morning. He had two wisdom teeth out that morning 
and was training that morning. Didn't care. That's the work ethic that he had. He would never miss. He would never miss. When we left the underworld gym in the city, we went and trained in Dandenong for a while. Tosca lived in Kilo Park. It's a hike. Yeah, it's a fair hike. Mm. Never once did he miss training. Mm. Never once. His work ethic, you couldn't question it. I remember one day I got a call from a promoter, Christopher Cronus, mm. who was Tosca's biggest promoter. He's probably the biggest promoter um, in, um, until Tarek Solak came along. Mm. But anyway, Chris Cronus was a very big promoter at the time and he rang me up and he goes, Paul, where was Tosca today? I said, what time? He goes, 11.30. I said, training, mate, at the underworld, like, like we always are. He goes, that idiot was supposed to be at a press conference. I had Channel 9 and Channel 7 News. I said, whereabouts? He goes, next door. Next door to where you're training. Sorry, I got in touch with Tars. I said, why didn't you tell me about the, the interview you had with Channel 7 and Channel 9? He mm. goes, they know I train at 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> that was his training came before. Yeah, before anything. Before anything. And that's the difference between him and Stan. Mm. If Stan saw an opportunity to get on media, yeah. he would grab it. Mm. But when Stan came back from the States, every single fight that he had over in the States, he had a little story about it and pictures and he just handed it them. Mm. Tosca was not into um, self-advertising. And that was probably one of his downfalls. Yeah. You know? It's probably yeah. one of his downfalls. Definitely. You see that a lot in the modern as well, that guys um, who are promoting themselves are a lot more successful, especially financially. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and that was probably Tosca's downfall, but because he thought, and I thought too, I was mistaken there as a trainer. Mm. I was mistaken there too. I said, if you just fight the best, mate, and keep winning, then you'll get the paydays that everyone mm. else does. But I was wrong. What do you, you know? what do you think fuels that fire in terms of Tosca's work ethic? He obviously, as we talked about before, everybody has nerves, everybody has fears. How do you take that fire and make it burn and in a good way, rather than letting it defeat you? Or... Oh, Tosca. Yeah. How does he? Do? You didn't have to teach him that. Mm. He just wanted to be there. He wanted to be. He wanted to not let me down. Mm. He wanted to not let himself down. But you know, you asked earlier if I was nervous before that fight with Mark Costello. Mm. Ask Tars if he was nervous before his fight. That guy, two weeks out from every fight, even though he had over seventy fights, would break out in a rash in his arms. Like clockwork. And that was a nervous rash. He wow. was terrified. Why was he terrified? You'd, you'd look at the bloke, you think there's nothing scares him. Mm. He was terrified because he knew that he would never give up. Never. And that's what I said before when you said you were scared. Mm. There's something wrong if you're not scared. Mm. It's scary knowing that if you're getting hurt so badly that you're not going to say that's, that's enough. Mm. And I'll tell you a story. He was fighting Ernesto Hoost in Japan one time. And Ernesto had chopped his legs badly. His legs were gone. Tosca couldn't stand up. Well, Tosca said he could. And he came back at the end of the second or third round. And I said, mate, I'm stopping the fight. You stop. Don't you stop it. I said, I'm sorry, mate, but I'm going to stop the fight. He goes, I can, I can still stand up. And he showed me that he could stand up. Like he stood up in the corner, but it was just like, oof, oof, oof. and he stood up. Mm. And then the fight started and I threw the towel in over his head because he would go there and get killed. He would have he gone just had that, and got killed. that mentality he couldn't give up. Yeah, he was not going to give up. And that's why he got scared. Well, I never showed it, but that's why the rash came out because mm. he knew he'd never give up. How quickly can you recognize that in somebody? Of all your years in fighting, how quickly when you, when you oh. see somebody and you watch somebody train, can you recognize that sort of unbreakable mentality? It's hard. It's hard. I'll tell you about a guy named Perry Nicolau. Mm. He used to train with us. He was a friend. He was a friend of Tosca's, close, close friend. Of, I think he was a friend of Tony Tokasha. That's how he came there. And he said to me one day, he goes, "Everyone's fighting. How come I'm not fighting here? Never fight yet." I said, "Because you turn away. Because you turn away." Yeah, I would have thought that, that bloke could never fight because mm. some would throw punches that he would. He would do that. Yeah, I said that to him. He never turned away again. Never. He mm. went on to become an Australian champion. Yeah. So how do you tell? Jake, it's pretty hard to tell. Mm. 
it's pretty hard to tell. I've seen people who are champions yeah. fighting and two champions fighting each other and it's it's head to head. It's a fantastic fight. Then I see someone's give up. Not not give up and mm. let everyone know, but I've seen that he's given up inside and he goes into defensive You'd mode. be able to recognise that though. Yeah. yeah, and I see that. And this is a person that I would have thought wouldn't have done that. Mm. I think it's a very irregular way to be though, like what, what Tosca that sort of thing that Tosca has as well. And I sort of think one of my best mates, I'm not going to name him, but I think he... Name him, come on, mate. <laughs> oh, you met him. He came, Geordie, who came in down and did a session with us. Yeah, okay. I think he's got a very similar mentality. Uh, <laughs> and that it's just like, can't be beaten, can't give up. And yeah, I think that you, you can kind of recognize it in some people, but it's interesting to think about whether that unbreakable mentality is... is Breakable. Can, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Or the, whether it's whether it can be built. Yeah. 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 I guess uh, because you're a very hard trainer and you, you really let's, put guys let's go back to Tosca. Let's go back to yeah. Tosca. His first loss. He had 17 wins. Mm. Then he lost in his 18th fight. He lost to a bloke named Manson Gibson, who when I saw the, the tapes that I had on Manson Gibson, I thought they were set up fights. Mm. He was so freakish with his spinning kicks, like he'd spin, spin and miss, spin and miss, spin and miss, and then catch him with a third wheel, spinning wheel kick. Anyway, he caught Tosca pretty badly. Tosca was wobbly. He had the Johnny Walkers, you know, like he's stumping <laughs> forwards, and the referee's counting, and he goes, what are you counting me for? He goes, take the count, Tarsus, take the count, <laughs> as he's counting. You know, what? Anyway, at about the seventh or eighth round or something, he's gone, how am I going? I said, you're behind, mate. You're losing this. Mm. He goes, what do I do? I said, go out there and rough him up. He, he went out there, picked him up and threw him out the ring. <laughs> anyway, he lost yeah, the I fight. I just would love that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was funny. It was funny. Yeah. But he lost the fight. Now, can you break that spirit in some people? Hmm. Because he lost that fight. He was at training the next day. Ten-round fight. Went the distance, so he's bruised. He was at training the next day. Hmm. That's not going to happen to me again. Hmm. That's not going to happen to me again. He hated it. He hated it. And I thought, wow. Wow. I recognised it with Tarsus very early on. Mm. He was at a gym in South Melbourne where we were training at. Um, we were training. It was a boys. It was a boys. Um, it was a gym gym for young kids, you know. And and I went there to help them out a little bit and take some classes for them. And a lot of us started to train there. And T Tarsus was training there. And Rod Car. Uh, was champion. Todd Tarsus was a kickboxer, wasn't a boxer. Mm. And Rod Carr was tough. Anyway, they started sparring. First round, Tosca's nose gets broken. Well, the usual thing is you stop the spar. Mm. Tarsus goes, don't stop the far. Mm. I said, mate, he's a boxer. You're a kickboxer. We're boxing. We're playing his sport, mm. not your sport. That doesn't matter. So he kept going. At the end of six rounds, I remember Dave Hedrick said, what are you doing to this kid? I said, I'm having a look at him, mate. Mm. He goes, mate, his nose is in trouble. So I said, okay, we'll give him a rest for one round. Yeah. So I jumped in with Rod, Rod Carr for one round. That was enough for me. Yeah. To ask, get back in here, mate. Yeah. But I was testing him out. I was having a look at him. And he he passed with flying colours. Mm. He didn't want didn't want to have that round at the rest, you know. Mm. Um, I've seen him with a um, with another guy named Peter Gillespie. Mm. Very, very tough guy. Very tough guy, from, I think, from out Ringwood way. He used to come and spar. Hey, Blake. He'd go ah, down to the Oakley gym there. No point in sparring him. I might as well shadow spar, you know. Mm. So he, he he enjoyed sparring Tarsus because Tarsus was there to fight. Tarsus would stand there and punch on with him. And mm. at the end of the end of the spar, they'd both stand in front of the mirror and say, oh, look at this one you got me. Oh, yeah, look at this one. Oh, look at my nose, <laughs> yeah. you know. You do get uh, a few tough people. Yeah, you know? yeah. absolutely. But, Tosca is probably the toughest. Yeah. Not probably. He's the toughest that I've met. Yeah. Yeah. How about Sam Greco? Sammy Greco. He's got a, a highlight reel and a half. I was watching it last yeah. night. Yeah. He's, he's in his, his K1 days. Spectacular knockouts. Yeah. He's got some spectacular knockouts. Yeah. It was a lot of fun training Sammy. Sammy. Sammy came to me. He'd been training with Dana Goodson and Stan the Man. Mm. And they'd had a bit of a fallout. In, and He'd had three or four fights at that stage. And, and um, I'm looking so great crew, great crew. We were training down at the Underworld Gym. We had Tosca. We had Sammy Greco. We had this big, tall friend of mine named Wade, big black guy. He was mm. six foot 
four two, a hundred and mm. something kilos. We had Dean Delic, all these four heavyweights. Some days I used in sparring there, I'd I'd just look around and realize that we've got 100, 200 people just come to watch the sparring. And in, in the underworld, there was an outside window that we used to keep open, and there was there was a grill there so people couldn't walk in there. And that was packed in the laneway too, out the back there people behind watching from the outside. Street. Yeah, it was huge. It was a really good time. Anyway, Sammy came along and um, you know, asked me if I'd train him. I said, oh, mate, it'd be, it'd be an honour to train. It'd be really, really good. And mm. um, with Sammy, Sammy, Sammy got a – big contract to fight in Japan in the K1 because he was well known there from his Kyoko mm. you know? And so we went to Japan four or five times a year for five or six years together. Um, Sammy had, Sammy was used to being a karate instructor. Mm. He was a Kyoko Shin instructor. So he was, he was the boss. So he was used to, when he trained, he trained the way he wanted to train. Mm. So it took a little bit, Oh, mate, you're training with me now. You do what I say. Mm. And it's very hard for someone. Like, it would be hard for me to go and train with someone else now because they would tell me what to do. And I like to train the way I like to train, mm. but I don't fight, so I can. Mm. But now you're fighting, Sammy, and you'll keep yourself in your comfort zone, and I've got to get you out of your comfort zone. And it took a little while for that to come through. Mm. But, mate, Sammy has a natural talent. He has the body of a Greek god, mm. although he's Italian, even though Greco sounds, <laughs> but he's Italian. Yeah. And he had probably the most potential of anyone that I, I knew. Uh, um, he, he was a wild fighter early on. He didn't really know how to box. I taught him how to box. Mm. And he used that to, to great stead. And I remember one day uh, when he fought um, Branko Sikatek. Who'd won the K1 a couple of times, and I said, Sam, I want you to forget about your boxing. I want you to go back to doing what you used to do, and go berserk, please. Mm. And if you look you look up on YouTube, have a look on YouTube. Oh yeah, I have. Tosca Petridis versus Branko Sikatek. Oh, I haven't seen that. No. Oh, you have a look at that. Look yeah. at Branko Sikatek. Yeah, no, ask me how to spell will. it. C I T A C, something like that. I'll find it. Anyways. <laughs> anyway, it was. One of the most awesome knockouts. He just does go berserk, like I asked Tosca. him. No, did I say Tosca? Yeah, you said Tosca. Sorry, and yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm talking Sammy. Greco, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. You have to correct me. I'm getting old. No, that's all right, mate. Yeah, <laughs> getting old, mate. Yeah, but, uh, but that was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. It stand a chance, and he was a K1 champion. Mm. Another time, Sammy was fighting over there. He was fighting the biggest name, one of the biggest names in Japanese fighting at the time, um, Musashi. Mm. Only one name, Musashi. Yeah. I was going to say Miyamata Musashi, but that's someone else. Yeah. Uh, Musashi. <laughs> That'll do. And Sammy walked out there and was fighting him. And Sammy was stronger than this bloke and a better fighter than him. But he wasn't making headways. What do I do, Paul? And I said the same thing. Forget about boxing. Go berserk like you normally did, mate. And he walked out there and he hit this bloke so hard that he landed outside the ring crashed onto one of the, the um, ringside tables there where the, where the timekeeper was, crashed that to the ground and was injured badly, so the fight's over. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Sammy won the fight because mm -hmm. how did the bloke end up outside the ring? Because to, because there I go, toss again. <laughs> Sammy punched him in there because he was injured oh, okay. from the fall, but the reason he went out there it was like was a WWE got, knockout. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was a fantastic one. <laughs> Semi Greco was great to work with. You know, yeah. um, he's doing pretty well for himself now as well. Yeah, uh, Sammy. Sammy. Um, Sammy runs a. Uh, yeah, he's, he's training Jimmy Crute. Yeah. He's in the UFC. Ben Sosoli, who was on the Ultimate Fighter as well. Um, a few other really good. They've trained with Dan uh, Dan Kelly down there. Yeah. He's a really good judo. Yeah artists and yeah they've got a good little team going on there for sure yes uh yeah sammy's doing very well with jimmy jimmy's a great fighter and mm. and such a gentleman too mm. you know he's a, he's a young young boy who's um i'm a big fan of jimmy yeah, yeah shows respect and i hope he goes a long way you know i actually was uh messaging jimmy on instagram and he he he, he replied i was just messaging oh, him messages of support and he replied so he's a he's a great bloke he, he is a good bloke no he's yeah. a good bloke and, and he's quietly spoken he's not big-headed or anything like that yeah and he's got the goods it's got the goods. Yeah. Really, um, I hope Sammy doesn't mind me telling you this little story mm. about him. I was watching him warm Jimmy up a few fights ago 
and uh, he, you know, he he's doing well. And someone came up to me, and goes, "How old is that bloke?" I said, "Jimmy." I'm not sure. He goes, "No, no, no, that's Sam Greco bloke." I said, "Oh, he's fifty or something." Like, How fit and strong is he? Because he's, mm. you know, have a look at him. He's 110 kilos and no fat on him at all. You know, yeah. And um, looks almost as good as me. <laughs> not really. He's pretty ugly. Have a look at his head, though. You know, he, he yeah, lose yeah. it with the head. You know, he might have the body of a Greek god, but he's got the head of a Greek. You know, <laughs> yeah. But uh, this bloke goes, how, "How old is he? 50? Oh, mate, unbelievable, fit and strong." Sam had a heart attack that day after that fight. Did you know this story? No, I didn't. No. Know. He he told me. I went and saw him in hospital. He told me I could feel it coming on. I could feel I feel something wrong. You know when he was warming Jimmy up, and then the excitement of the fight as well. Mm. And as soon as the fight, but Sammy walked back in and goes, "Oh, I'm in trouble here. I'm in trouble." And they said, "Oh, we've got an ambulance coming for you." To, and he said, "I didn't wait for the ambulance. He went straight to the hospital on his own. Someone gave him a lift. Otherwise, he probably wouldn't be here with us today." Jesus. Yeah, yeah. It's funny how he had how he knew it was his first time having a heart attack. Yeah. Yeah, he just he had this. He just did not feel right, you know. He just did not feel right. Wow. Yeah. So he can come and hit any of us. Yeah. So I hope I don't mind you saying that that in public, yeah. Sammy. But uh, he's. Yeah, I hope um, I don't, hope I don't, He doesn't yeah. mind me calling him a potato head either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know the bloke. I shouldn't be. You shouldn't. <laughs> uh, yeah. So 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 Sammy, <laughs> that just shows that he didn't want to let let Jimmy down, mm. despite what he was feeling in his own body, mm. you know, and. Yeah, you've got to respect him for that. Although probably a bit stupid. You know, yeah. I think Jimmy would have rather he go to hospital straight away had yeah. he known. But yeah, he wouldn't even let on. Wanted that, to be around you know? for many fights to come. He wouldn't yeah, that's right. That's yeah. Right. But he will be he's, you know, he's made a good recovery and, yeah. and, and says he's feeling pretty good. So yeah, he's so training so you train that I can call names and get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you Cameron think you Eyes. Can. <laughs> Oh, yeah, maybe I can't. Cameron Eyes, Eric Diamondstein. Uh, Cameron in particular is an interesting story in the fact that he started at Frank Dando's Martial Arts Academy with you. Um, how have you seen him progress as a fighter and as a human being since you met him? Cameron Eyes. Let's talk about Cameron the person before we talk about Cameron mm. the fighter. Mm. Cameron um, was a school student of mine, as you said, at Frank Dando Sports Academy. Yeah. Not Frank Dando Martial, Martial Arts, Arts Academy. Academy. It's, Sorry, mate. <laughs> it's a school for kids... For boys, yep. intelligent boys. I don't know if it really um, mm. works with Cam there. It's a school <laughs> for intelligent boys that don't get on in mainstream schools for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. whether there's family breakups, drugs in the household, getting in trouble with the law, whatever. They're not getting on in mainstream schools and it's probably their last choice. Mm. So they come to us and, and our philosophy is, is that we teach them mathematics and English and sport and sport takes up 50 percent of the curriculum mm. and a typical day there we do boxing in the morning or judo or kickboxing in the morning and then we do a bit of english then we go and swim for an hour then we come back and do uh, do some mathematics and then we might do a few push-ups and a few sit-ups and that sort of stuff before we go home it's the regular day sounds like a pretty good school doesn't mm. it you know but it's pretty hard mm -hmm. you know we you know, the kids get away with a lot of things sometimes, but sometimes they don't. You know, so yeah, the, they get they wouldn't get away with a lot of things that other kids at, in regular schools yeah, would. You know, if 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 a boy at that school says, "Oh, I don't feel like swimming today," I don't you put your bathers on. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of a bit like that. So yeah. it's 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 really it's a really good school. Mm -hmm. I, I've been there for nearly twenty years now, and I love that. I love working with those. Thought I'd a, a job where I'm there. And I want to go there every day, mm. and it's a bit like um, it's a bit like boxing, kickboxing to me. You mm. know, I love it, uh, and, and I love I love at being at Frank Dando's. Yeah, Cameron came along to Frank Dando's many years ago. Well, he would have been fifteen years old or fourteen years old at the time, and things weren't going well with him. He'd he'd get get out on the weekends, nearly every weekend, even as a young kid like that, get on the piss start fights with big groups of Maoris or whoever he could find, you know, mm. and often just get beaten up and he just keep on causing trouble. And he was, he was on a road to self-destruction for a number of reasons. And, uh, one day he said to me, can I come and train with you? Because I train people from home. I train, that's where I, I train a lot of the fighters now. That's where I trained Eric. That's where I trained Cameron. 
I've got a decent gym at home. And he, he knew that. And he said, can I come and train you? I said, yeah, you can, mate. But the rules here, when you come here, you come alone. You don't bring your mates and it's just you, the training. And and he's very, very independent. Like he lives in um, Williamstown or Port Melbourne at the time. Mm. And sometimes people, you know, like when Tarsus was training, when Tosca was training, he said, do you want to lift? No, he didn't want to, he didn't want to put anybody out. He just wanted to come and train sit on the train at night time and go home and do, do his own thing. He didn't want to be a burden on anyone as a young kid. And I've got some great photos of him on our gym wall and he just looks like a young kid there. Hmm. I've it, seen his, uh, his, uh, all of his amateur fights on, not all of them, all the ones that are on YouTube. Um, and yeah, it's so funny how he looks. So small. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he was like Tarsus. He was like Tosca that, that he didn't miss a session hmm. for a long time, for a long time. And he, he trained hard and that, I, was a little bit too, I was a little bit younger then so I didn't have what we needed and all that sort of stuff and every day we'd have little competitions to see the most double skips you see mm. and I could, I'd always just be able to beat him a little bit you know mm. and it got to the stage where no I couldn't beat him anymore you know couldn't that's what you're anymore. on I guess yeah and he 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 really thrived on the fitness aspect of it and it helped him with his road to self-destruction mm. big time because you have a look at him now. You would never think he was a troubled kid. No, not at all. You'd never think he'd had issues like he had. Mm. But he's overcome that and and boxing has enabled him to do that. Mm. You know, it's something that really it really speaks to me in as a person as well because from when I was 14, I had some real troubles in, with my home life. And um, I, I used to get in trouble with the law. I used to do, go get on the piss as well. I used to, I know. Mm. I used to... Uh, you know, all the, all the same stuff. I got kicked out of like three school good guys. Had I haven't got something for Frank Dando's, that would have been a perfect way for me to well, do my schooling. Have you, <laughs> you would have put me through my paces. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I guess that was a way, like my way of lashing out at a system that wasn't that that wasn't right for me. It wasn't suited to me because it's not for everybody. And uh, yeah, I get, I, I'm I'm fortunate that I have like a very strong mum who sort of dragged me through that eventually put me in boarding school then kick ship me off to london to go and live independently and I, now i'm good so yeah. Well, but yeah that really speaks to me so he with... reckons that he's good yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah behind the camera <laughs> <laughs> yes like getting back to getting back to cameron um yeah. it was really good to see uh at his first amateur fight when he finally finally thought he was ready to fight mm. and um he fought his mum and dad are having a few issues with each other. They're arguing and that sort of stuff. And it was good to see this is when so Tosca, I'm talking Eric, I'm talking Dinesh, I'm talking Brendan Party, I'm talking all these people who trained with us, all these guys treating Cameron like a man. Hmm. He was only a 16-year-old boy. But they, was, they were all treating him like a man and with respect. Because he earned Before that. and after the fight and after the fight because he'd earned that. And I remember watching his mum and dad's face who were looking at him going, this is our young baby. <clears throat> yeah, that is your young baby. Mm. And they saw that and they saw the next fight as well and the next one as well. And they saw the respect that their young son had. And now that young son has gone on to university and you know, I think he's got a master's degree. Master's in yeah. and conditioning. He's got yep. a master's degree, uh, and that was for a boy who was on self-destruct. Hmm. And he's turned his life around and became a good fighter. He had when he turned. Actually, I'll tell you about his second amateur fight. Hmm. My Brendan Party has been in the corner for with, with me for probably a couple of hundred fights, I suppose. You know, yep. he's been around a long time, and he was fighting. Ben, um, ben, ben wasn't fighting. Um, Cameron was fighting this guy who was covered in tattoos, mm. uh, was much older than him. And Brennan goes, oh, even after all that experience, he's still, he's still a bit worried by mm. appearances. You know, appearances mean nothing. Yeah. Cam knocked the bloke out. Slipped the guy's left jab, bang with the right hand, fight all over the first round. Mm. And... Um, it was it was a good lesson for Brendan, <laughs> and it was very good confidence. Don't boost judge for a book by its cover. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. right. Definitely don't judge a book by its cover when it comes to boxing. Yeah, you know, I've seen the most the fittest 
bronzed, beautiful guys come out there and get smashed by mm. lobby. Yeah, <laughs> hairy, hairy yeah, ass, like you know, yeah. I've seen it time and time again. You know? Yeah, and it's uh, one of those sports where once you're in the ring, there's no bullshit, there's no excuses, there's no blaming your teammates yeah. or anything like that. It's it yeah. is it's going to be what it's going to be. It can intimidate <clears throat> you seeing someone like Sammy Greco standing in front of you, mm. but when you've got experience, you know they're human just like you. Mm. You know, I love that. I love that saying in that Rocky movie when he's fighting Drago. You know, and um. The Drago is just giving it to Rocky. Remember the mm. scene? He's giving it to Rocky and and back in the corner, Drago goes, he's not human. <laughs> and uh, they go to Rocky's corner and uh, Rocky's, Rocky's trainer goes, because he was cut. Drago's, Drago, the, the Russian bloke was, was cut. And he goes, he's human. Yeah, we were all human. Yeah. <laughs> Except Rocky. Yeah. We were all human. Different story, Rocky. Anyway, Cam- Cameron had a, um, he had a good um, professional career mm. he fought as a welterweight and junior welterweight and he, he won both victorian titles for mm. that um he was he was training um here one day and he was sparring and just at the end of the round he got caught with a big shot and we all laughed about it mm. and cameron being cameron didn't tell me how much it had affected him and so a few days later he's sparring again and he gets wobbled by a punch that he would never be wobbled by Hmm. Like his brain, he obviously had concussion, but he didn't tell me. That's why it's important to anyone who's listening. Hmm. If you've got a trainer and you've got a concussion, you tell them. Hmm. It's so important. You know? hmm. Anyway, he got concussion and and so he said, oh, we have to take a bit of time off from your sparring, which was disappointing because he's fighting for an Australian, he's training for an Australian title. Hmm. And um, so he took a bit of time off from sparring. So he continued with his running, continued with his pads, and continued with his with his his to sparring. And he got caught again. And then he sat down. And he goes, "I said, mate, the fight's in two weeks. It's over. You can't fight." And he had trained so hard it was heartbreaking mm. it was heartbreaking because he had trained so hard for two or three months for that fight and and to build up for years mm. remembering where he came from mm-hmm. and and this is what he wanted this is what he wanted and he couldn't do it i said you just can't do it mate he goes oh, or maybe maybe we'll just go and fight anyway and I'll just try and land a big one on him. Yeah. You know, he's looking for a way to talk me into it. You didn't want him to get hurt. And I didn't want him to get hurt. No, of course yeah. I didn't want him to get hurt. And also, Cam's not a big puncher. Mm. Cam wins by Technical. throwing 100 punches at you. Yeah. So that idea of me throwing a big shot at him, if he was a Sammy Greco, or well, maybe. Mm. But he throws a million punches at you yeah. to knock you out. Be yeah. like Jeff Fennick. Mm. Be like Tosca Petridis. You know, he's not a Gurkhan Oscan who had 30 knockouts in the first round. Yeah, you know, or Sam Greco who could do the same sort of thing. No, he needs that time, so that's not going to happen, mate. Yeah, and he sat there and he's sitting there with tears in his eyes. You know, he he, and I could understand that. Mm. I nearly had tears in my own eyes too. And I said, "You've got to give yourself a break, a break from sparring for six months, mate." At the end of six months, we come back and we start again. And if it happens again, it's over. It's over. Hmm. Cameron's very intelligent. He's smart. A lot of people would come back after six months and give it another go, but he realized how long it took him to recover from that from that concussion. Hmm. He said, I came in, <laughs> missed the light switch, going to turn it on a few times. Hmm. And that happened for some time. And he made that decision himself. In six, he knew that it's not it's not that important. Yep. There's other things to do. Yep. There's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I'm very, very happy with that decision. So he retired at eight and one? Something it? like that. Yeah. Yeah. Eight yeah. And, one? and he never he never did get that shot at the Australian title. Yeah. But he's done so much. I oh, mean it's I remember some, some spars he had hmm. um down at uh Jim and St. Kilda. And he he they said, Oh, this guy will look after Cam. Mm. And they just barred three rounds. This guy was a rated three in the world. I've forgotten his name. You know, I've got old son, which is <laughs> it was a fantastic spar three rounds. The next time they sparred was four rounds. The next time they sparred was five rounds. And this bloke wasn't looking after him anymore. 
he wasn't looking after mm. because he couldn't look after him. But he had to fight. He yeah. had to train. And in the end, I remember turning around, 100 people or so came to watch those spars. It was unbelievable. I wish I had him on tape. What, um, how old was Cameron? This, this was Cam, um, towards, you know, when he's, when he had about six or seven fights, mm. he was unbelievable. And mm. he never showed his full capability in the ring mm. when he actually fought. He never showed that he, he was much better than what he'd actually showed. And that was going to come after a few more fights. Yeah. Once you get your man strength came. when you're a bit yeah. older. He could have gone a long way. Yeah. He could have gone a long way. That's what pretty much everyone says, just prodigiously talented yeah. boxer and yeah. hard worker. Hard worker. Yeah. Not natural talent. Mm. Hard worker. Like really hard worker. Mm. Like Tosca. He was like Tosca. Put yeah. a lot of work in there. Yeah. yeah. He, he was unfortunate that he got caught like that. And it affected his brain. It does affect some people's brains like that. Mm. That's not a weakness. It's just the way you way you are. And he was smart enough to say, I'm not going to go down that way. Because I remember very, very early on, the first time he came to the amateurs with us to watch, there was this old blokes walking around and the old judges there and they're walking around <laughs> and they're tripping over. They end up like that, mate. Be careful. <laughs> and when he when that night, when we were talking about whether you go on or not, I said, mm. remember that night there? And he says, oh, I remember. Mm. And it's got to have strength of character to give up something that you've strove for, strived mm. for for so long. Yeah. But he did so. You know. And he's a good trainer here now. He's a, he's a wonderful trainer. Yeah. And he knows what it's like to train hard. He's a very good technician. Mm. So as a, as a coach, fantastic, mm. fantastic coach. Do you see him going quite far in coaching now? As far as he wants to. Mm. As far as he wants to. But it's the old thing. It's you can go as far as you want to. You know, you can only you can build only build a house if you have enough bricks. Mm. Otherwise, you build a bit of a shell. So it depends on the right person to come along for it. Mm. Yes, mm. I guess you had a few of those right people. I've been come along as well. I've been yeah. lucky. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I guess we can. Okay, Don't sorry. you want to talk about Eric? Let's talk about hey, Eric. I won't miss out Eric's on Eric. Eric's <laughs> gonna, Eric's gonna yeah. Eric and I have a funny beginning. Yeah. I'd forgotten it. Yeah. Until he reminded me um, after I'd been training him for some time. He rang me one time and said, I'm after a trainer. Blah, 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 mm. blah. And I wasn't really interested because I had enough people to train. And you can't take too many people on because then you're diluting yourself. It's like the five fit challenge. Mm. You know, I've got I've got forty or so 30, 35 people there that I'm training for the fights. That's why I tell them all, get a personal trainer. You need that person in addition to yourself. Mm. In addition to me, because I can only look at you so much. Yeah. So it's good to have that personal trainer with you as well. Yeah, you've got a lot of people yeah. to look at. Yeah. So Eric asked me. And uh um, I said, no, give me a call back next year. And he did. He did. He waited a whole year. He waited a year and he gave me a call back. You can't knock someone back who does that, can you? No, not at all. No, no. And so Eric came along and trained. Another intelligent person. Mm. Another very good coach. Mm. Very good coach. I'm, I'm, I'm unlucky. I haven't had much to do with. Eric, unfortunately, but um, yeah, he absolutely, I've seen, I know a few of the guys that he trains and they all absolutely love his training. Yeah. He trained, he trained as hard as I asked him to train. Mm. Um, he, he started off kickboxing where Cameron just boxed only. Uh, Eric was a kickboxer. He kickboxed before me he, with, with, with another trainer. Um, and I actually reckon his best fights were with this other trainer, not with me. <laughs> Don't thought... say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, he, he decided to get into boxing because he he'd gone down and he was sparring. Um, he was sparring a guy his own weight, mm. and when he'd finished sparring with him, uh, the trainer said, "Oh, could he do a few rounds with this other bloke?" Blah bloke was a heavyweight. I said, oh, I made the big weight difference. Hmm. He goes, oh, no, he's only a novice. He'll just just move around with him. Anyway, he kicked at Eric's leg. Eric checked it, pushed his shin right in, did his posterior crucial. Hmm. That was pretty much the end of his kickboxing career. Yeah. You know, stupidity on my yeah. part. I should have said, no, we've had the spar. He was on line for 
he was just looking beautiful, mm. you know. And I say, yeah, yeah, go on like that, you know. And uh, anyway, so that was the end of his his kickboxing career, and he started boxing after that. Mm. He did quite well in boxing. Uh, the the thing that um, I remember most fond fondly not fondly fondly <laughs> you said fondly i don't know why you brought up fondling <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um is that his last fight hmm. when people have boxing decided boxing, boxing yeah. when people have their retirement fight so many times they bring out some journeyman hmm. some blob who they can just beat up and look fantastic hmm. And I sort of understand that too. It's the end of your career. Da 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 da. da. So who do you want to fight for your last fight? Eric goes. Who's out there? Who's out there? Who's going really well? Hmm. Who's out there? Who's tough? Because I can't fight someone who's not tough. I can't fight someone who's not good because I'll perform like that too. Hmm. And people said to me, "Why have you?" I can't remember the guy's name. Or Simon's again. He goes. People, people said, no, 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 don't let him fight this bloke. I said, he wants to fight him. I said, he's, mate, this bloke's young, he's strong, he's at the peak of his career. Hmm. I said, that's who, that's the sort of person Eric wants. And, and other people came to me and said the same thing. What are you doing letting him fight? You're an idiot, Paul. You're an idiot, you know? I said, because Eric's got pride. Hmm. Eric's a proud man and does not want to go and fight against someone who is not worthy of it. Someone that he can beat. Over. What's the point? And Eric got beaten in his last fight. Hmm. But that didn't matter. It was the fact that he knew he was stepping with someone who had a big chance of beating him. He could hold his high, hold his head high. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and I remember that. Wow, that's really good, mate. Good on you. Hmm. And Eric's also smart. Hmm. He's the only one who's retired. Him and Cameron so far. Who hasn't said, "Oh, I wouldn't mind coming back." He knows, mm. and he knows he's got other things in life for now. You know, he's he's he he makes jewelry. I don't know if you know that. He's a he's a very talented artist. I've I got, had absolutely no idea. In my gym, he asked. He, I've got a picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger doing doing one of those poses. You know, mm. trying to look like me. Arnold was. Yeah. And um, <laughs> Eric borrowed that photo and came back a couple of days later with the yeah. same thing in pencil. Really, really good from no training, and now mm. he makes jewelry. You wouldn't pick it. No, yeah, you, would, quite an you would not. Yeah. But yeah. power to him. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And in addition to that, have a look at him coach. Mm. You watch him coach. Mm. I have watched him a few times. Yeah. yeah. I'm a bit of a stinge like that. I like to watch Eric and Cameron coach and not pay for it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just go and watch. Right. Yeah, because he'd probably charge you a few dollars. Like, yeah. He's not cheap. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and he shouldn't be cheap either. No, absolutely he not. He shouldn't be cheap because he's, he's very talented. Yeah. yeah. They're both very talented. You know, we're very, very lucky here at Fight fit to have mm. so many people who are good who are people good people's people as well yeah they, they have really good people skills and great and great real presence about them too which is which is what you want they really project a lot of strength onto their their clients yeah and they're always up for a chat as i said i don't i don't pay any of them but like i always go and chew their ear off or yeah. pick their brains i mean i feel sorry for cameron because sometimes he'll be skipping or shadow boxing and i'll just come start shadow boxing next to him <laughs> skipping next to him. so cam when, when you're fighting that <laughs> yeah well, and try and just acquire a little bit of knowledge here and, and as you say they're very approachable yeah and they will talk to you you know they're not they're not going to talk to you unless you pay me no, yeah, yeah. Like that, you know we've got we've got dinesh as well mm. as an instructor you know? what a lovely fella oh he's a great fella. <laughs> do you know much about his fighting career i've watched all of his fights on youtube but oh. i what about some of those knockouts? The, but the thing that I love about Dinesh is what, his celebrations. You would never pick it. But like all the celebrations that he does after his fights are hilarious. <laughs> he goes, wow, well, he's normally so cool, calm, collected. Yeah. 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 He throws his axe kicks in the air. Yeah, yeah. 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 I remember one incident with Dinesh. He was fighting in Sydney. Again, against someone I don't know his name because I've forgotten. And uh, they were the referee was giving them their final instructors instructions. And as we got to the corner, I've got out. Me being a bit of an old man, trying to get out of the yeah, ring, struggling slowly. to get out of the ropes. And I hear two two people re- sitting ringside, two officials sitting ringside, said, "Oh, oh, I'm so worried for this bloke from Melbourne. Hmm. He's going to get smashed." Before I'd actually got 
onto the ground and turned around to watch the fight, I hear, whoa, and I turned around, the other bloke's on the ground. <laughs> 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 oh, so much for worrying about the wrong that bloke. Yeah. <laughs> and Dinesh, had, and the fight was over. Oh, no, no, I won't tell you the end of the fight, but that's, that's what started. Yeah. That's what started. Yeah. Oh, that's unreal. I remember watching one um, of Dinesh's fights. I can't remember who it was what with. I should have. I should You've have got Alzheimer's too, mate. And yeah, exactly. It's, it runs in the family. Yeah. But, um, this rounds of, I've ever seen. Yeah, it was it was the round. Actually, actually, I think they gave it fight of the year. Oh yeah, well, yeah. He was a young up and coming. The name is on the tip of my voice. Yeah, my, tip of yeah, my tongue. I don't quite remember either. And he had given Dinesh a couple of eight counts. Mm. He caught Dinesh with these big punches, mm. and he just came back. And Dinesh hit him with one. Yeah, and it was all over. Yeah, <laughs> and I said, "What were you doing, Dinesh? Well, yeah. How can you get hit with the same punch so many times?" He goes. I was just trying to make it exciting for you guys. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, we got a great photo of, yeah. of him and after that, you know, yeah, yeah. Dinesh is one of these ones who doesn't want to retire. Mm. He thinks he'll do it better now. Yeah, yeah. You know, he had so much. He's still potential. sparring. You still see him sparring a fair bit. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. he's strong. And he's strong. And he he has that ability. Like if he was concussed before a um before a, a huge fight like an Australian title fight, then then yeah, the, the possibility that he could talk me into letting him fight because he can knock people out with one punch. Mm. And he did it so many times. I think the quickest fight he ever had, you know, from where to go was 16 seconds counting the count, including the count. Yeah. Um, but I don't like people if they get hurt. Dinesh, unfortunately, mm. either won by knockout or lost by knockout. Mm. Because he thought defense was that thing you have between your house and your neighbor's house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was a dad joke, and you laughed. Well, that's pretty bad. Mate. I'm stealing that. I'm stealing that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's a wonderful. He's a wonderful guy. Yeah, and uh, lovely and, fella. And he has quite a following when it comes to his classes and mm. his coaching. Yeah, it's his, his own way. Yeah, actually, by chance, ran into him. Um, I was because I worked for the Salvos. I was taking some of uh, like the homeless guys down to Sammy Solomon's gym, and uh, Dinesh was there. I was like, "Oh, what are you doing here?" He's like, "Yeah, just here to help out." And I was like, "Oh, good on you." <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's, yeah, he does that his entire yeah, life. You, yeah, you wouldn't. You, yeah. no one would know about it, but he's yeah. just doing that just because he wants to. Yeah, yeah. So, do, do you see yourself continuing with the fight fit? challenge and being the head coach of the fight fit challenge for years and years to come or do you sort of feel like confident that there are others who could who could fill in there is definitely shoes? others who could fill my mm. shoes there's always someone who can fill your shoes you yeah know? um i'm just not going to let them yet yeah yeah i <laughs> enjoy it i really do enjoy yeah, it i can tell um how do you how do you um how do you how do you sleep at night when you give us 300 burpees in one session, uh, like a baby, <laughs> like a baby, like a baby. But uh, I do them with you, so it's fair enough. Yeah, yeah you do. You do. Enough. To be fair, fair you enough. don't crack a sweat. Though. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the five fit challenge developed from an idea, um, second year I think of of mm. its existence, when a few a few of the guys who were training, or a number of the guys, got together and said and said to Joe Kershia, who started Fight Fit. Mm. originally um how about you guys train us for some fights and then joe curcio came to me and said how about we keep the fights in house mm. because there's a number of other shows now that do similar things to fight fit mm. but different but different mm. the difference being at fight fit everybody trains together mm -hmm. and i get to look at everybody and I get to match make. Mm. I get to go, uh, yeah, they'll work together. Mm. Or not, yeah, I've made a few mistakes, but it's only a few. And we've we've had 18 challenges 19. now. 19 now, yeah. Um, that's if, if I go to one of these other shows where they get people from different gyms, sometimes you have people who've never fought. Mm. They've been training 10 years. Mm. I've seen it many times, and no one, no one will, no one to be that coach who puts an who puts the guy who's not as experienced in either. Everyone would want their guys to win. Yeah, so and that's the thing. He's here, and that's what I tell to the tell the um, trainers. Hey, 
this is not about winning. This is mm. about the journey. Of, of, of yeah. course, it's about winning. We all want to win. Mm. And that's what makes it so good. That's mm. what boxing is so exciting because yeah. you all want to win, you know, and it's, it's, it's you against one other person. Mm. And yeah, but it is about the journey too. Mm. It is about But you guys right have work. genuinely got our best interest in yeah, mind. I do. I do. Yeah. And I really try. And sometimes I put people together and people say, what are you doing? I said, no, you watch. You watch. You watch. This will be an even fight because mm. I see how they spar and I, I see their personalities. And sometimes I can see things. You might get a lot of mismatches if it's done in another way. Mm. You know, because one of the most difficult fights to train for, train someone for, is their first fight because you don't know who they're fighting. It's someone else who's brand new as well. Someone yeah. else who's, and you don't know what they're like. Most likely to have their first fight or not not many fights. If, yeah. yeah. You know, when Sammy Greco's fighting someone in K1, mm. it's someone who's had 30 fights. Mm. But I know all about them because mm. I've watched their last 30 fights. <laughs> I know what they do. It's easy to train for them. Yeah. Training, training for someone, the first fight is very hard. You've got to train them in a generic way. Mm. And let's see at the end of the first round what happens. Sometimes you'd, you'd have people who'd really surprise you when, when they get out there on the night. It's just like, where'd, you, where'd, where'd that come from? Yeah, I always talk to tell everyone the story. I might have told you the story when with winning the Fight Fit Challenge mm. of Vinny. Vinny was a little Indian taxi driver, mm. a little fat Indian taxi driver. <laughs> he walked in and he said to Joe Kershaw, I said, I want to fight on the Fight Fit Challenge. Okay, good. What's, what have you done before? No sport. What about table tennis? No table tennis. He'd never done anything. <laughs> He'd never done anything. Yeah. He was hopeless. He was pathetic. <laughs> Did not know how to throw a punch. If you're doing 100 burpees, he'd do the first five. Go, oh, this is a bit hard. Yeah. He was <laughs> at sparring. He just got copped it. About six weeks in, he'd had enough of being punched in the head mm. and started punching back. He won his fight by knockout. <laughs> and everyone wanted to fight him because he yeah. was hopeless. Yeah. Yeah. So it's amazing what it can bring out in you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I've had, oh, what's that girl's name? Anyway, I'll do the challenge. Yeah. At the end of her first sparring session, I said, how was that? It was, it was horrible. <laughs> At the end of the fight, there was a girl who'd won standing in the middle of the ring with her hands in the air going, yeah, yeah, yeah. An unbelievable transformation. Yeah, yeah. Transformation Completely. from that first bar to that, which was only four weeks. Mm. It goes to show that we do not know what we're capable of unless we no. capable of unless we try. And that's why I don't want to let it go yet, Jake. Mm. Yeah. I don't want to let it go yet because it is a lot of fun. It's yeah. a lot of work, mm. but it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And I love it that people come into the gym, pro boxers, friends of mine, it's, these guys can't fight in six weeks because you guys are two weeks in. Mm. And yeah, the first four or five or six challenges, I doubted myself. Mm. But now I go, you wait and see. Mm. And Breeze and the judges who come to these fights, they go, these fight nights are better than the pro nights. I've been to many um, fight nights at Melbourne Pavilion, including the one where a few blokes got shot a few weeks ago, but that's a different story. Um, and the Fight Fit Challenge... It wasn't Dave Hitchcock again, was it? No, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised. No. Um, but this, the, the Fight Fit atmosphere was absolutely electric to the point where I was so into it that I, I was watching the fights. And there was a few fights before my one. And then, then it was the fight before my one. And Breno, my coach, comes up to me and goes, mate, Put your gloves on, and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> yeah, I better start warming up." <laughs> yeah, but yeah, and and obviously the level of improvement that the guys go through mentally, physically. I lost nine kilos. I was absolutely stoked with that. Um, and the way that you watch, that I watched other people grow as well, was just really, really awesome to see. And it's made me completely fall in love with, with this gym, and the years of fight fit challenge and the fight fit games, which I'm hoping to do in the future as well but yeah it's just such an awesome thing yeah it's it really is a lot of fun as i said and I, it's 
And as I said, that's why I'm not going to let mm. Cameron Eric take over yet. Mm. You know, yeah, but you're they're very beating cap- them off with a stick at yeah, 90 years old. Yeah, they're very, they're very, <laughs> they're very, they're very, they're very capable. There's, there's a number of people who are very capable of taking of taking the fight bit challenge. Yeah, but it's uh, it's something that I really like to do. Mm. Uh, I get a lot of pleasure out of it, seeing the growth, mm. and uh, and the hope this one that's coming up is mm. going to be as good as the last one. And yeah. it's funny because everyone is the best one. Yep. It's better than the last one. It's better than the last one, you know. All you can do is keep improving it. Yeah. So what 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 would you say to me? Backtrack nearly a year now. You know, just doing my thing, training here a little bit, and then walking out one day, sort of shuddering. Uh slip that I had to fill in, questioning whether I'm gonna do it or not, and then I put it down and tried to walk away before Bash before Bash goes to me, oi. What are you doing? You're not. Gonna, what would you say to that guy? It's better than watching TV. Mm. It's better than going home and turning on the telly. Because mm. you know you're alive. Mm. Because you're so scared. <laughs> it's probably not a good selling point, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the truth. It's true, though. It's the truth. You will probably never feel so much alive than just before you walk in there. Mm. And afterwards how good does it feel and as you walk especially in and then while you, you're doing es- it yeah especially when you win yeah yeah <laughs> it's it's funny yeah you know, we say we don't do it for winning but winning is the cream on the cake mm. it's the icing on the cake yeah you know? absolutely I, was, I can't remember who it was but i was talking to one of the other guys on the podcast the other week and i said that i was completely like there's no sort of pussyfooting around it i was completely motivated by the win like yeah. the, the journey was was obviously really a draw card as well but i wanted to win so badly yeah. and that's one thing i've noticed with the people here at fight fit that that the ones who decide to go for the fight fit challenge they are driven people mm. and that's what makes the fight so good mm. because there's something about that person they're not fighters, but they're the people with the drive, mm. and they turn that drive into the fight. And even if you're not the most driven person, by the end of that challenge, you will be. Yeah, yeah, you would have pushed yourself mentally through so many different barriers that you never thought that you could have. And then the fight night comes around, and you and your th- this experience that you never thought that you would have. It's like being a professional athlete for a night. You've got the cameras all flashing. You've got the people cheering you. You're out. Obviously, um, all filmed as well. You can go back and watch it anytime you want. It's something you can take with you for the rest of your life. So, it's it's funny because I I remember some um, one of the contestants walked in and went, oh oh this is the real thing. Hmm. I said, what did you expect it was going to be? Said, oh, this sort of be going to be a ring in a little warehouse Someone's or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the real thing. There's lights and there's, yeah. and there's dancing girls, dancing boys. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, there all, is. All this yeah. sort of stuff. Actually, my son, Nick, he's telling me that he'd do it again this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the ring boys. Thing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So we'll see. I mean, but, um, <laughs> yeah, they, it's it's the real thing and, and that freaks some people out. Mm. That's why I say it's good to, if even if you haven't been there, have a look at mm. the Five Foot Challenge on YouTube and get a feeling for it because you might walk out there and get – Rosen, like yeah. I remember Andrew Asieta, Andrew Asieta as we call mm. him. <laughs> he had his first in the first round, he didn't throw a punch. Yeah, he froze, not one, not one. Yeah, he had asked for that first round. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did. He came back in his second fight and won that, so yeah, it's okay. But, um, yeah. I remember before my fight, I was talking to, um, I was obviously shooting myself as everyone was, which is a key because everyone's shooting themselves, you have to remember that. And I went and talked to uh, Pierre, who was about to go. And Pierre's, I think, done. Six, He's done seven, or six or seven. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, "Mate, how are you feeling? Are you are you used to this now?" And he was like, "Man, oh, he's French. I'm not going to try doing his accent." <laughs> and he's like, "Man, I'm shitting myself. I don't know. Every time I do this, it gets to ten minutes before, and I think, why am I doing? Why about it again? <laughs> yeah. Why, why do I put myself through this?" Yeah. And I was like, "Oh God, if he's shitting himself, then far yeah. out. And I've got the right to be as yeah. well." <laughs> Pain and fear have short memories. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah, a good way. Forget about yeah. it and go, and you come back out and. Why am I doing it? Yeah. Why did I say yes? Mm. But then you're there. What's the what's, what's the alternative? Mm. Go home and watch Game of Thrones again. Mm. Actually, it must be starting sooner. Yeah, I'm trying to dodge the uh, social media stuff. 
laugh about it because I'm watching it tomorrow night with my mates. Uh, yeah, <laughs> be a good laugh. Don't want to see anything. Yeah, seriously, go and watch TV or go go and have a fight. Mm. Go and do something that you'll remember <clears throat> for the rest of your life. Mm. You know, you won't remember what you watched on TV that night. Mm. And it, it's great for your mates too. I remember uh, your mates come along to support you or to see you lose. Mm. Either I remember Jimmy Newt is who's, uh, who's a friend of mine. He 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 sold a lot of tickets. And I reckon most of them are coming to see him lose, you know. Yeah. And as soon as he started copying it, gee, then your friends come through. They wanted him to win badly. Yeah. Oh, this is serious. This is pretty serious. And they were cheered for him and cheered for him. And it was funny to see, oh, gee, I hope he cops a couple there mm. to all of a sudden, Jimmy, go, go, go. Mm. And it was just, yeah. It was fantastic. I don't know if you uh, saw Johnny Benson's uh, friends on the side of the ring there when he was fighting, but they were going absolutely mental because it was a really close fight and right. a good fight and they were both going so hard. Who did he fight again? I can't remember his name, the guy. I can't remember his name. He didn't get to, oh. he didn't train that much. I think he was training. Um, he was Collingwood sometimes. Yes, yeah, a few of them. Yeah. 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 Johnny, Johnny was one of the um, Frank Dando boys. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. one of the Frank Dando boys. So. Yeah, he's a good man. Well, actually, I've known, oh, him for, I've known him for years outside of Jim. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. we're friends. With, we have a lot of mutual friends. So yeah, it was good. So, were you Johnny. screaming and yelling for Johnny? Or for of course, I was. I was right amongst all the boys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. You told me before. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping to. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's good. It's good seeing people that I know. And uh, mm. you do this thing. Can I come along and fight? You know? mm. And we get a lot of people who are fifty years old doing it. You know, mm. which is pretty amazing. And and. A few, you have a few 50 year olds bash young blokes as well which is hey. good you've had a few 50 year olds beat young blokes as well if we have we yeah. have yeah, it's great seeing that you know? yeah it's great seeing that was that was one of my mistakes one yeah of my mistake. uh had alistair who mm. um runs doherty's in frankston i think now mm. he run the one in the city and he was coming and he he was a he was he's strong. Have a look at him. He's strong, and um, he was a young bloke. Mm. And I put him with his old bloke because I thought the old bloke had been around a fair bit and knew how to handle himself in sparring. You couldn't hit him, you know. Mm. And Alistair was young and raw, and I thought that'll oh, be an even match. Alistair just went bang and knocked him straight out. This mm. And I just felt so bad and looked bad because we had this young, fit bloke with abs, nice biceps. I don't fancy or anything, Alex. Alistair, but you know, yeah. just describing you, and, you uh, and the other blokes an older bloke, <laughs> and he gets caught. Yeah, you know. But then again, I've seen the other other time. It was mm. the last one or the one before. The bloke was uh, fifty two or something, and he's fighting a bloke in his early twenties. Mm. And I thought, no, the old bloke will beat him. And it, it, you know, it'll be close. But I was worried. I was youth mm. can I but no, it didn't. This time, the older bloke won. Yeah, but yeah. You yeah. truly do never know what's going to happen. I mean, I remember watching some of the fights and being like, I'm not, like, oh, you know, I reckon this person's going to win. I reckon this person's got it in the bag. I reckon that's a bit of an uneven fight. I reckon that's going to be a really even fight. You just never know what you're going to get because when when it comes down to it on the night, people will people will either sort of produce a lot more than what you thought they could or maybe they might get really nervous and produce less than what you thought they yeah, could as well. That's exactly right. Yeah. Don't know. So you don't know it and yeah. yeah. And people get very, very tired. Mm. What's the old saying? You can't get fit enough mm. for your first fight. Mm. Yeah, because you're exhausted regardless. You certainly don't want to leave any any stone unturned, that's yeah. for sure. And I, mean, I when I was young, I was pretty fit. Mm. And I mean, when I had a fight against Marcus Eller, the American champion, I came back at the end of round one and my coach, Johnny Pascuzzi, said to me, how you feeling, Paul? I can't tell him I'm fucked already, can mm. I? You know, <laughs> first round, <laughs> first round. Yeah, you know, and I was fit. Yeah, and I was young, feeling great. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, through all of your experience in the fighting world, in your personal life, in in business, what would you say are some of the things that you've really taken away that are the most important lessons for living a good life? Oh, that's a big question. The answer is forty-two. <laughs> <laughs> What are some, sorry, I'll, I'll rephrase it. Thank what you. are some values that you would like to project onto, say, your fighters or the people at Fight Fit that you train here? What are some of the things that you'd like to really impart onto those people that will help them live their best, most productive life? You must be happy. Hmm. You must be respectful. 
those two things. Mm. Happiness makes life much easier. Mm. We take ourselves put too much importance on ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. Just, mm. just be happy. Mm. Be happy, easy going. And you must be respectful. Mm. Yeah. Treat everybody with respect. Treat everyone nicely for everyone's fighting a difficult battle. Mm. We're all teammates, I guess, at the end yeah. of the day. It's, it's, a, it's, it's nice. It, if someone is not the, not the happiest at the time, they're probably really struggling. Mm. So treat everyone nicely. Yeah. Because who knows what's going on behind closed doors. And quite often we're too quick to take things personally if somebody of does have a, a like and a project something onto you which yeah. is not nice but yeah it's really good really nice way to look yeah, at it actually yeah. don't dwell on things as mm. you say if something's bothering you don't talk to the person mm. yeah yeah all right well mate i think we've gone well and truly over the time limit but i've had too much fun to <laughs> to potentially stop it so yeah is there anything else that you'd like to bring up before we wrap it up oh, just the game of thrones is overrated yeah yeah don't tell me, mate. Don't, don't, I don't want. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Mate. Always a pleasure. We'll see you shortly.